Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll be getting a few more yeah. minutes as people trickle in. Probably get started in about two minutes here. So we realized there was a conflict because it's also the mayor's state of the city address at the same time tonight, which we unfortunately scheduled this beforehand. So thank you for those who attended. And if there's a conflict, the mayor's speech will be recorded as will this. So you can follow up. Okay, can you go to the next slide? Let's yeah, I'll let's you want to go ahead and get started. Sure. Um, yep. And I can also go ahead and launch our, our poll too, just as folks are trickling in um, for folks to share how you're connected to the neighborhood. So I'll go ahead and do that now. That's great. So the poll just went up. So as you enter the room, people, please go ahead and fill that out. So hopefully you are here to learn about McKinley Hills. Art and identity is part of the neighborhood planning program. I'm Lauren Hukamer, leading the planning, the neighborhood planning program with Annika Olson. And we're really excited today to have Chris Dottinger from Pretty Goody Tours, who's going to give us an overview of McKinley Hills history and identity and what makes it such a special place. Uh, then we're going to have our uh, Tacoma Arts Office and SpaceWorks talk a little bit about what we can do to get art into McKinley. So. They are local experts and we are excited to, to have them here. And we'll end with some group discussions about what you guys can do and how you guys can all get involved to lead the planning process and create and manage and lead uh, the art that comes into, into, our, into the neighborhood. And it, it looks like most folks have taken the poll. I'm gonna close the poll in just a second so that we can you can all see who else is in the room. So I'll go ahead and um, end the poll now. So we can see over, over half of you live here, but many other ways that you all are connected to the neighborhood. So thanks for being here. So, so I believe the next slide is our land acknowledgement, which is very important given that it's a big part of McKinley's history and identity. Ati duf ati swat with food a teach poy all a parch a slasa sil alti disha to alturi to ha. It is the land right here that the Puyallup people have lived on since the beginning. Disha ti dufa chas alti swat. Oh, sorry. Please hold. Ati duf ati swat with food a teach poy all a parch a slasa sil alti disha to alturi to ha. It is the land right here that the Puyallup people have lived on since the beginning. This right here is where we are in the world, our homelands. We work on our ancestral lands. We raise our children who go to school on the land of the Poyalit people. We acknowledge that the Medicine Creek Treaty was signed for the whites to take our land for their benefit. Land was assigned to our people. The Caucasians said, this is your land, and they took that land from us too. 
o karari tab chas ati swad huft pod chas o zak atab tish kliti our land was stolen from us treaties were broken toch didi chas a ati slacheo but we are still here today u hui hui chas tu kwelin chas tu ish our people forage for food and materials, we pick berries, we canoe, we practice our traditional ways, and we speak Tulshutzi. Just as our ancestors did. We are finished. Thank you. So now we're going to do just a very quick overview about the neighborhood planning program. Basically, this program was created by city council to help enhance neighborhoods, uh, develop strong communities, improve diversity and grassroots efforts. And so uh, this year we're focusing on McKinley Hill and the Proctor neighborhoods. Slide, please. So this is a little bit about the process. Basically, it centers community engagement uh, you all get to make the plan. You all get to decide what goes into the plan. You get to decide how any funding is spent uh, and what the implementation goals are. So right now we're in the engagement phase. We also have a consultant who's going to be doing some analysis and then we'll switch into the implement implementation phase, phase and we'll talk a little bit about that as we talk about what our working groups will do. So these are some of the main areas of focus that were identified in the surveys and in the first meetings that we did. Um, they're not the only thing we'll be focusing on, but we will be determining that through the stakeholder committee. And then each subject area will have a working group that also helps guide that implementation. So uh, at the end of this meeting, we'll be putting up a sign up chart. So if you're interested in working on any of these categories, um, sign up. There will be lots to do and lots of ways to get involved. This meeting is about arts, culture, and identity. Uh, so we're excited to have that conversation and we've got some, some cool implementation things started. So this is just a quick overview of what the whole plan will look like. It'll be some analysis, existing conditions. Um, we did last year, the Historic Preservation Program did a historic survey and I'll post that link in the chat and we've got Susan Johnson here from the preservation office uh, who's going to be helping us with that part of it. Um, we'll be looking at the existing policy framework. So this program is really implementing all the goals that the city's already set out through the comprehensive plan, through Vision 2040, uh, through the climate action plan. Then we'll be working with all of you to determine what the strategy is, what the issues are, uh, what your goals are for the neighborhood and how you want to get that implemented. So now I will hand it off to Chris to lead our tour. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a rundown of the, the neighborhood's history and kind of my interpretation of its identity. You can feel free to disagree or agree as much as you want, but I think we've done a pretty good job with it. Uh, but first and foremost, we get to hear from Brandon, who is the assistant director uh, for the tribal history, and he's going to talk to us about sort of the history of the area before it was McKinley Hill. See if I can bring it up here really quick. Hopefully you can see that and let's see if we can hear it. McKinley Hill is in the complex of the Spoil Pups Village site. So um, we have, we know we have artifacts in the area above McKinley Hill. It was an obvious lookout point, which provided views for incoming traffic that could have been viewed as either friendly or hostile. We had a warrior village at Browns Point that was there for the defense purposes, but McKinley Hill, knowing that what we have, so up on McKinley Hill, we have artifacts that are all um, warrior related. So we have projectile points or arrowheads. All the, the 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 debutage or the the midden that is in the area is all so is all showing that these were used for areas that would have been for weapon making. So real heavy in in stone uh, flakes, 
which is, is what comes off of the, the stone as you're, as you're making your arrowhead. Um, you know, so we, we, and we know from oral history, um, the late Judy Wright talked about the villages up on top of the hill were used as outlook um, for protection. So we know that likely this area was used as a warrior, um, either training ground based on the number and types of um, projectile points that we are finding here. Uh, some are very finely crafted, some are very um, rough. So you know, from you can you you can tell that you had young men uh, learning the process up here. So assuming that that would mean that they were doing training, um, and then you had fine points. And you have points that are really well crafted. So you had somebody there also knowing what to do. So again, lends towards the 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 training aspect. Um, but then you just look at the the general topography of the area up on a hill. Um, it's also a flat kind of area, so um, as we get further away, not very far, but as you get out towards like 38, 34, that sort of thing, start seeing more. There were some artifacts that would show prairie use, hunting use, so it's also uh, the further you got away from the hill, you got into uh, kind of the gathering and hunting um, aspects of it. Likely with knowing that cedar was very prominent in the area, they were probably, probably harvesting cedar, harvesting uh, cedar roots, um, cedar bark. Um, then of course all the hunting you know we had game in the area too so deer elk rabbit um, probably fowls too i'm sure they were setting up traps for uh, for birds um, so I mean, the whole area had a really nice i mean it was it was how that was a grocery it was a grocery store if you want to put it in today's terms um further got away from the Hill, but uh, just the area itself heavily used um had uh, a large population just being so close. I mean, like I said, it's just up the hill from Spoyala Punch. Um, and I would, it, it's not traditionally thought of as being part of the Spoyala Punch site, village site, but due to its proximity, I I should say, Judy Wright, who was our historian, um, she never counted the McKinney Hill area as part of the Spoyala Punch site. However, due to the proximity, I, I would, I would put it in into as being part of the, the village site just because uh, there would have been interaction between the village just down the hill and across and around the area. Um, she always listed it as five major sites that consisted of what made Puyallup, and this would be my sixth, um, but I'm not qualified as <laughs> people to make that official. I got I got a couple more years where I can, I can say that, but um, just it would just make sense. I mean, just it, it's one of those things where um, because of the, with it being a, a training ground and then just a little bit farther off, like I said, um, the village site there off the uh, the gulch, at the top of the gulch near 38, um, you know, while it wasn't down on the river, like the Puyallup folks were, um, they were very closely related and very closely, you know, had plenty of interaction. And it, it itself, um, a very large, uh, Midden and debutage site um, lens that it was also a large site as well. So probably we don't know the numbers, but probably had several longhouses and structures up in in that area too. So you know, very very connected to the large village sites down on the, on the river. Perfect. I'm gonna switch over really quick to our other presentation here. So what? I love about what Brandon shared is the the connectivity balanced with the isolation of the hill in Puyallup tribal history. And I think that's something that you can see kind of translate forward to even now. One of the defining characteristics of the McKinley neighborhood is the fact that it's on this hill that was separate from the rest of Tacoma for a pretty long time there. And so here's a, an early shot of downtown Tacoma. Uh, and you can see that clearing over there circled in the red, that is the hill that ends up becoming McKinley. And in the early days of this neighborhood, it was called East Tacoma. Uh, it's had some reiterations throughout time. 
uh, it was, let's see, depending on what map you look at, at what time, you could equally call this Bismarck, East Tacoma, McKinley, or Hawthorne. And this is a picture from the hill looking back towards Tacoma into what would now be considered uh, the old Hawthorne district or where the Tacoma Dome is. And I love this shot because what I love about McKinley is the fierce adoration for this neighborhood. So this is when we did an in-person walking tour of the neighborhood back in maybe 2018. I'm trying to remember exactly when that was. And the show out, the, the amount of people that arrived for this was staggering. And then it just dumped rain. It was like a complete tsunami and people were there for it. And they're like, all right, they just zipped up and continued on through the tour. And I was like, this is perfect McKinley <laughs> because what you see, and here's, here's the old map underlined in red there is the, the neighborhood of Bismarck. And you can see as Tacoma was developing as a major city in the 1880s, there was this outlying community that was difficult to get to because it's on top of a hill. It used to be the highest point in all of Tacoma. And you had, to, you had to walk up the hill to go home. And so it wasn't like the most popular spot for people. It wasn't prime real estate. But what ends up happening is it's an empty space in between sort of downtown Tacoma and the port district. And it ends up getting occupied by the doers, the makers, and the creators of Tacoma. First, uh, carpenters show up to the area. So all of these shipwrights, carpenters, and railroad workers that are building the city of Tacoma come out to the McKinley area and just start building their own homes. They have small businesses. They have shops. They kind of occupy that space. And so when they're not building Tacoma proper for the railroad barons. This is the little community that they build for themselves perched on top of the hill. And eventually the, the railroad catches onto this and in right at the turn of 1900, they donate about 27 acres to be developed into a park. And another one of my favorite McKinley signature things is how things are named, right? So this is called East Park when it's donated and the people responsible for East Park put a tremendous amount of detail and pride and conviction into turning it into this lush oasis. And one of the things they were looking forward to was that President McKinley was gonna come visit Tacoma at some point and they were gonna have this park ready. Uh, and unfortunately, McKinley gets assassinated and while the, the laborers are down in the park getting it ready, the foreman hears this news and they just are devastated. And so he's like, you know what? We're gonna call this park McKinley now. And then they did and it stuck. And that is pretty much the genesis of how the neighborhood gets, gets its title uh, is from this community rallying together over an event and being like, this is what we wanna do. And so that's what we're gonna do. McKinley Park has continued to be a major center of pride for the neighborhood and also is kind of the, the gatekeeper because when you were looking at original neighborhood, when it was East Tacoma or Bismarck, you had a lot of places like this, uh, which were right on the edge of the port. You had a lot of carpenters, machine shops, blacksmiths, uh, and shipwrights who set up their own individual sort of industry centers right on the border there, makers and doers, and then they would just go up the hill and have their homes there at night. And to, to get home was, was an arduous thing. Uh, I believe the Tulshutsi name for the area pre-Bismarck was Wad Shum Shum, which I think means trail to the high ground, if uh, I did my research accurately here. And so you can see it's it's surrounded by gulches, right? It's on this high point and it's got very narrow, very steep access points. And so creating bridges to the area was a, was a high priority for the people of Bismarck slash McKinley. And as, as they were wont to do, they're like, we'll just do it ourselves. 
So all these carpenters living out in East Tacoma were like, all right, let's build a bridge. And so they made an enormous trestle bridge that spanned the entirety of the Gulch back in the 1880s. And the picture here is of when that was replaced in the 1930s by the, the concrete bridge that they have today. Uh, and you can see it was a huge undertaking uh, and they risked quite a lot getting this done. But again, you had a lot of that sort of holdover of the same people who are making trestle bridges for the railroad who had taken that knowledge and skill set here and could just employ it at will, for example, building an enormous trestle bridge over a cavernous gulch. Once the neighborhood becomes connected through transit, though, it still maintains that independent attitude and that reputation of being a part. And that is further stressed in the 1950s when I-5 comes through and essentially just decapitates half of the neighborhood. There was not a super clear boundary between, you know, uh, the McKinley East Tacoma neighborhood and what would later become Hawthorne, which is, if you look at the map, directly underneath where the Tacoma Dome is today. And you can see that was the neighborhood and it really just gets completely cut off from the rest of its, its body by I-5 coming through the area there. And now McKinley Park becomes its own entity into the McKinley neighborhood, no longer connected to really downtown Tacoma through its original route. The only way to go is essentially over, over the bridge into McKinley. And it has, I think, an opportunity now to sort of revel in its isolation. McKinley becomes more independent in its own mind. Uh, these are just aerial maps from the 1930s that show, uh, you can already see McKinley Park down there at the very bottom, and then what would become later I-5, and really how it took out a huge chunk of that zone uh, and separated it forever. Uh, so here again, this is Hawthorne as it was developing. This is Hawthorne in the 1970s before uh, it would be later demolished and turned into where the Tacoma Dome is today. And then you see the remnants of that like 1880s, 1890s sort of boom town explosion in the McKinley neighborhood today. So one thing that you'll miss, uh, this is Hawthorne Elementary. <laughs> Like I, like I can't stress enough with McKinley, they first called this uh, East School because it was East. <laughs> uh, and then later they got together and they're like, you know what, we like Nathaniel Hawthorne, let's name the school after him. And so they did. Uh, and it was a major school for that McKinley area until eventually it was abandoned and they went to larger schools. And that was a big push in the area in the 1920s was creating more places for this population that had showed up. You've got your masons, your, your carpenters, and your creators from you know, Tacoma now living in the McKinley area, and they don't want to go across the bridge all the time to do something. So people were like, you know what? We can, we can make stuff happen. And one of the good examples of this was Park Theater. So this building is still in McKinley today, though you wouldn't recognize it uh, from looking at it, it's the uh, American Legion Hall today. It's got that stucco veneer over the front of it there. But this was once one of the main sources of entertainment in there. And in fact, had a massive pipe organ that they ended up taking out of the building and giving to the local hospital. Uh, but this is what it looked like in its heyday. Back in the 1920s, you would go in and all of the, the ads for local businesses would be up there. And I love this because you see how much was going on in McKinley. Because since you have all these entrepreneurs, essentially these small business makers and creators out there, they were just creating whatever they wanted out there to now feed the community on a micro scale. And that's, that's continued as a legacy of the McKinley neighborhood. Uh, I see a lot of places there that are really there first and foremost for the people of McKinley. It's kind of a, a community that comes together and provides for their own. And I think Top of Tacoma is a beautiful example of that. It's my absolute favorite like vegan dive bike 
bar craft brew scene in the city of Tacoma. It's like the perfect core sample of what's going on out here. When someone's new to town and they're like, what's the, what's the deal with Tacoma? I'm like, well, you're gonna have to go to McKinley and check out top of Tacoma. Not too far, just a couple blocks down, you'll see remnants of that um, really impressive artisanship of the area. Uh, and this, this is the Holgerson house, I believe. Uh, and he was a Norwegian immigrant and master carpenter crafter who built, you know, a lot of the beautiful designs for the city of Tacoma, but he himself was like, I just want my own house. And so this incredible building now on the historic register, uh, is just a couple blocks down from where top of Tacoma is today. The other thing that you see show up in the 1920s is you know, infrastructure to help support this blossoming community. So a tremendous amount of schools show up like McKinley Elementary, uh, Rogers and Galt, as well as churches. And it becomes very much a place where the community rallies together to take care of itself. A good example of this was uh, Geo Davies grocery store here. And this is like quintessential early 1900s McKinley. You had bakers, grocers, dry goods out here, um, really just designing a place to take care of the rest of the neighborhood. Today, you see a lot of that in the churches that are there. So I believe Trinity Methodist here is an example of one of the early churches that showed up out in the McKinley district. And these are fantastic because nine out of 10 times what happened was you had a congregation of Baptists or Methodists or whatever, we're like, we really need a place to worship that's close so we don't have to go across the bridge or down the hill or anything. And so now you had like 50 to 80 people who are like, well, as it turns out, I happen to be an accomplished Mason slash bricklayer slash carpenter. And so they would just get together and build their own church. Then to facilitate this influx of people who are now being attracted to the McKinley area, you start to see things like the Porter Apartments show up here and uh, very wisely, the very first thriftway in the area shows up. And now people are like, all right, we can continue living here forever on our, on our hill now that there are more services popping up. And so this is there today. Uh, this is just down the street from where top of Tacoma is. Porter Apartments continues. Uh, and the, the bottom level was transitioned into the, the very first cocktail bar in the area up there on the hill. Uh, some of the places that you won't see are like McKinley Park Bakery. Uh, these structures are no longer around, but they were transitioned into buildings that served a very similar use. And, and this one I love, I always share this with people when I talk about McKinley, because this is another great example where, again, McKinley was isolated, right? It's on top of a hill, it was hard to get to. And so the decision was made that the neighborhood needed a streetcar. And so the people of McKinley, the, the crafters and the makers got together and they're like, shoot, we'll just do it ourselves. And so they built uh, a, a line, a streetcar line into the area. And it was the second time that had been done back in the 1880s when they were completely isolated from the downtown corridor. Uh, the, the first guys who came out and started building like a lumber industry there and were building houses wanted a way to connect their mill and business to downtown or the port. And so they just built their own rail line. That's, that's McKinley. Uh, it's a community that's fiercely independent that wants to be connected sometimes. And so they just do it themselves. Um, this is just on the corner. Uh, this is not too far down from sort of that main section of McKinley where the Piggly Wiggly used to be. Uh, and you can see the streetcar line right down there on the bottom of that, that photo. Another example of McKinley just getting it done uh, is with the, the library, uh, the Motet Library which was the third library uh, for the city of Tacoma and was again, just a community project where uh, the gentleman who was living here in memory of his late wife had a library designed for the community by um, Silas, the architect Silas out in the area. And so just put some money down and they built this. And this is what it looked like in the early days. They have expanded it a couple times to accommodate the thirst for knowledge in the area. But that library is still right down there as a part of the McKinley area today, a testament 
to the fact that McKinley has always been able to take care of itself. Uh, and a lot of the, the homes down there too are a good example where either there are craftsmen like this, where you'd order it from a catalog, it would show up and you'd slot all your pieces together, or because these people were uh, the, the builders and the carpenters for the city of Tacoma, they would often just build their own houses just out of their own imagination. Same thing goes for the schools. The schools were a huge source of pride for the area because it was built by the people who were designing and building the rest of Tacoma. Uh, of the ones that are not on the historic register, Galt is, is one, and that's a building that has seen obviously a great deal of flux. For those of you who live in the McKinley area, you're not unaware of that. Uh, it, is, it is there today, and I know is going through uh, a preservation effort as we speak. And another one that I just like to highlight for people, this is one of the first churches out in the area there too. Today, you would see it directly across from the library with uh, Tacoma Indian Baptist Church right there. Another great example of McKinley coming together as a community is in their establishment of a firehouse out here. And Engine House number 11 has one of the awesome distinctions even though it was built in 1909, as serving still as a functional firehouse. And I think that's another key feature for McKinley, is that uh, it seems like the neighborhood really likes to keep what they have, but not on like a, a shiny trine, not in a plastic wrapped couch. McKinley likes to keep their stuff functional. Uh, you know, that's why there's still a, a bar at the bottom of the Porter Apartments. That's why Engine House number 11 still functions. That's why the schools are still active, because when something's in McKinley, uh, the time and the effort is put in place to make sure that it keeps working for the long haul. Today, I think you see an incredible amount of uh, diversity in the McKinley neighborhood. Uh, Brandon really was a big advocate for stressing the fact that the Puyallup people have continued to live in that area. Uh, even after the Treaty of Medicine Creek, a lot of people have continued to call the McKinley area home. And it has become, you know, a safe haven, like I said, for the creators, the makers, the, the industry of Tacoma. And a lot of people have been able to find a space to take their dreams and make that a reality in McKinley. So when you show up there, there is a fierce pride in the neighborhood, and it is a neighborhood more so than a lot of others in the world that has really been designed to make sure that it takes care of the people that are there and to make sure that they can continue working in their trades throughout the area. So with that, that's, that's my rundown on my McKinley, one of my absolute favorite neighborhoods in the area, which from time immemorial has been a training ground for people learning to, to make and create and has maintained that legacy even till now. Great, thank you so much, Chris. That was a great overview and just a great way to segue into what we're gonna talk about, continuing that, that legacy of doing and creating and McKinley taking care of itself. And we're gonna talk about how do we now uh, translate that story into an arts and identity uh, symbols for the neighborhood so that we can really convey what makes the neighborhood special. So please continue, Annika. So what we heard from all of you already was that you, there's a lot of pride in the history, pride in the diversity, pride in the parks that you really want to tell the story of the Pialup tribe, of the Hawthorne neighborhood, and of the uh, neighborhood's uh, changes uh, through time. So as we develop this plan, this plan is really about implementation and not just making a plan that's gonna sit on shelves, but really, really being able to do something in the next 12 to 18 months. So the first steps to that are going to be working with SpaceWorks, who's gonna talk in a few minutes here, and they have funding to take you all through the exercise of creating a mural for the business district. And we'll be putting together an arts and identity working group that will guide the hired artists in creating the mural and figuring out what story it should tell and where it should go um, and all of those elements that go into it. 
Uh, we are also going to be hiring, <laughs> excuse me, an artist to create some branding and identity signage. Um, so that will be coming soon as well. And that's something that we're working with the Pialop tribe for so that we can help tell their story and incorporate their history. Um, we'll also be working with Metro Parks and seeing what opportunities there are there for uh, updating signs and art in the parks, uh, and then also creating functional art with uh, TPU and Public Works as we talk to them about different amenities that, uh, that we can add to the neighborhood. We don't yet have funding for a large scale permanent piece, but that's something that we can put in a recommendation to the plan. Sorry, I've got a crying a crying toddler here, so I'm gonna wrap it up really quickly. Um, so that's sort of the overview of what's what's going on with art so far, and I'll turn it over to uh, Rebecca. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everybody. No, no, no. My name is Rebecca Salverson. I'm with the city's Office of Arts and Cultural Vitality. And um, we do a lot of different things in our office. Uh, we, we fund things, individuals and organizations. Um, we do community programming like Tacoma Arts Month and the Tacoma Poet Laureate and other and, uh, professional development opportunities and other things. We also administer Tacoma Creates, um, which uh, many of you may know is um, a program that works with, that funds arts, culture, heritage, and science and works a lot with um, out of school time for um, Tacoma Public School students. And of course, public art, which is what I'm really here to talk about. So I manage public art projects for the city and also for partners like Metro Parks and um, am excited to be um, supporting this project with you all. Um, could you do the next slide, please? So uh, public art as, at its base is any intervention, any art intervention in the public realm. Um, at the city, we work on anything from small temporary interventions um, like traffic box wraps, which you see at the in the middle at the bottom there, um, or like the storm drain mural that we installed in McKinley over the summer to big multi-layered permanent public art projects like we saw in Lincoln a couple of years ago and everything in between that includes murals and um, um, anything in the public realm. Um, and we are also responsible for maintaining artwork. So anything that is um, done through our program will have some thought put towards maintenance. And if it's permanent, um, uh, it'll, it'll be something that the city works to maintain um, as well. So a lot of our funding comes from th something called 1% for Art. So that is um, a program where the city puts aside a small percentage whenever we build a big building or do a big infrastructure project. Um, and so you tend to see a lot of public art and a lot of the bigger public art in places where there's been a lot of city investment um, and infrastructure and in buildings. And, um, and I just wanted to, I'm, I'm gonna show a couple slides with a little more detail, but there are a lot of things to consider when we're talking about public art projects. Um, obviously the bigger, more expensive ones are gonna have, have more things to consider, um, but, uh, and I think these are all pretty self-explanatory, but I did wanna just, um, point out the second to last one here, artist qualifications. That's something you all will be talking a little bit about in your um, breakout groups later. Um, and it's really important in addition to things like cost timeline, maintenance, to also think about who's creating this work, um, what voice you want them to bring to the project, um, what communities do they represent? Um, is it important that they have a connection to the place or is it okay for an outsider to come in and do it? Um, and all of those things. So um, as you're thinking about this, think about who, who should be telling the story of McKinley and, and what different voices should be brought in. Um, thank you. You read my mind, Annika. Um, so I hesitated to provide this information because um, it gets so specific, but I wanted you all to have just a, a ballpark idea of, of kind of what it costs to create these pieces. Um, and this is from the very smaller, pieces um, that are more temporary interventions like the traffic box wraps all the way up to the big uh, multi-layer permanent public artworks. Our artists also do a really great job of working with community. So um, it's a process too. It's not, we, do, we never just come in and plop something down. It's always um, working with, um, with community for community um, by community, hopefully. Um, so this is, please just take this with, take that with a grain of salt, but um, for ballpark. Um, and then timelines also, timeline is a really big um, factor as well. I know everybody's excited to get going. Um, there, 
um, there are some immediate opportunities we're looking at. If I would love, um, we have something, we have a storm drain marking program. I'd love to work with neighbors here. If anybody's interested, um, either get in touch with me or with Annika or Lauren and, and we can make that happen. But there are also shorter, uh, shorter term interventions like murals. Longer term projects take a long time, but um, it's, it's important to start those conversations now. And, um, and we're hoping we can continue to work in this neighborhood and do something a little bit more than some of these temporary interventions. Um, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Gabriel Brown with SpaceWorks. Um, we uh, are really happy to be able, this, the arts office is really happy to be able to support a mural um, through SpaceWorks uh, in, uh, in McKinley um, that we'll start, we'll start the process on now. So this will be going in very soon. So I'm looking forward to working with you all on that. And I'm gonna hand it over to Gabriel. Hi, thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so my name is Gabriel and I'm a, I'm a East Side resident. I've lived on the East Side for six years now. So um, I'm really, really happy to be uh, just here with you tonight, but also to just be doing this project is like, it feels just like an amazing, I'm, I'm really happy to be doing this project in, in, in the neighborhood I've been in for a while now. And, um, and uh, I also coordinate all of the arts programs that we do at SpaceWorks, uh, SpaceWorks Tacoma. And um, SpaceWorks Tacoma is a uh, program that uh, offers support and training for artists and entrepreneurs in, in the Tacoma area. And uh, we're a 12 year old nonprofit uh, team of four. And uh, we are a program of the Tacoma Pierce County Chamber. And uh, as Rebecca mentioned, we have um, some. We have a contract to to, uh, to make some of our pu uh, our public art projects happen through the city. So these are these are city dollars, tax dollars, um, and we we have currently five thousand dollars that we can uh, put towards making a mural happen in McKinley. So it's a nice mm -hmm. kind of concrete thing that we can make happen. Uh, you know, next in this process. So um, yeah. So okay. So this mural that you're looking at right here, this image. Um, we are showing you this because this one, we just organized this last year. It was just painted uh, in 2021 by Peter and Araquin Boom. Uh, they are our local local artists. Um, Peter and his son, he painted it with his son, Araquin Boom. Um, and Araquin is a, is a Puyallup tribal member. And uh, they painted this beautiful piece. And it was a $5,000 budget. So it's a similar kind of budget, similar kind of scope. Well, we can pull off something about this size and scale, uh, just to give you give you all a sense of um, you know what what we can what we can do here. So, um, it's 15 feet wide and 30 feet tall. Um, most likely in McKinley, that would be horizontal. So something about 30 feet wide, probably you know 10 15 feet tall, something around that size. Um, we we could potentially do. It could be it could be smaller. You know, could be stretched out. It's obviously we're going to be looking at spaces and still talking about that but um and then just a uh, couple other side notes is uh you know of uh, the uh we will absolutely make sure there's a wall plaque that has additional information obviously the artist information the funding sources but then um a statement by the artist to really anchor in, in the place and then um we always offer like a link online to so the artist can provide even more detail and like for instance with this one uh, Peter offered to do a voice uh, voice recording of his artist statement, which describes every element in this whole piece and all the meaning behind all of these symbols from the top down. It's like ten minutes long. It's a beautiful description of of um, the meaning of these symbols and the all the thought that went into this this mural and uh, the importance of having such a big native mural downtown Tacoma is is huge. So um, so yeah, this was a, this was a cool piece and. Um, just showing you that. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we um, have funding to make one mural location happen in McKinley. Um, the next uh, phase after this meeting tonight, we're gonna go into breakout rooms and we're gonna talk about and ask for input right now from you guys about this, about this mural that we can do. Um, but the, that that information we do tonight will go forward um, to the artist arts working group, um, which will be a you know a separate group, and it can um, and it'll have community input as well. And that that's where it'll really hash out the details for selecting the location of the mural and selecting the artist. 
Um, and then, so yeah, in our, in our breakout rooms tonight, we are going to work uh, um, looking at identifying themes and, um, and such. So um, I'm going to uh, pass it off to Michael Lang, my coworker, Michael Lang at Spaceworks, to, uh, to introduce the next part. Hey, everyone. Uh, Michael Lang. I'm the director of Spaceworks Tacoma. It's great to be here and thank you for the invitation. We're so excited for this project. So my job is just to help orient everyone to the breakout sessions, which will happen right after this slide. So we have several facilitators um, on standby and we'll have about 30 minutes to talk about what art looks like in the McKinley neighborhood. Um, so, uh, and there's kind of two different sections. The one will be about the specific Spaceworks mural project we really kind of want to hear from you, like when you imagine a mural in McKinley, where specifically on which buildings would you like to see that? And then in order to help make that happen smoothly, do you have any relationships with those property owners or those business owners? Um, we have some questions about who the artist should be, thinking about should it be an east side artist or someone regionally and what are the implications of who the artist is? And then what kind of uh, impact uh, are we looking for uh, for this mural emotionally? What kind of stories or themes? Uh, what don't you want to see in a mural? These are all bits of information, community feedback that will help guide the working group uh, to make some of their decisions. So if you're interested in participating in this working group, uh, Annika and Lauren will provide instructions towards the end on how to sign up for that. Uh, but your feedback tonight will directly help guide this working group. The second half of the breakout session, we're going to talk a little bit more broadly about just the role that the arts play in general in McKinley. Um, historically, how have the arts played out? If you imagine five years into the future, what are the things that you'd like to see? Because the city is starting uh, the, the budgeting process for the next biennium. So thinking largely about some of those big asks, now's the time to kind of uh, put together that vision. And then also whose voices are missing? What are some of the cultural um, art forms or traditional art forms that uh, where you see you have residents represented there, but maybe not through the arts and the expression of the arts in our public spaces. So um, it's the, the 30 minutes are going to go by very quickly and uh, we will have a facilitator and then also we will ask for someone to report out on just think, you know, one, two or three things uh, from the breakout group to share when we come back. And then I think that's it for the night. All right, passing it back over to Annika or Lauren. Yep, so uh, right now, as Michael said, um, you're, you're about to get an invitation to a breakout group with a wonderful facilitator who's gonna take notes on your discussion. So Mary, whenever we're ready, um, let's go ahead and get those breakout groups launched. And we'll see you all back here in about 25 or 30 minutes. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hey, welcome back. Um, I'm, I know probably many of you got cut off, but that's because um, that's because hopefully the conversations were flowing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And I know Michael um, set us up for success getting into the breakout groups, and it's going to be my job to keep us on track because we only have 10 minutes left and we have uh, seven groups that need to report out. So uh, hopefully you were able to identify somebody in your group who's going to be the reporter for your group. And uh, that person has less than 60 seconds, so it's going to be a real challenge. Um, but let's go ahead and start with group one, which was Michael's group. Yep. Um, so we, we've got Lynette who is going to report out for us. So okay. the, yeah, please share the top two, two or three things you heard in the group, Lynette. All right, um, so we chose um, the areas would be like uh, 3420, Dr. Mary's old building, VFW, 3510 McKinley Avenue, or JJ's at 35th and McKinley. And um, what we would like to see is a person represent um, the McKinley area and what it is, or just get a good feeling from it, some mind, heart, good feeling when they look at it and walk away. But we would like to have an artist, one with a connection to Tacoma or excited to uh, paint our idea. And then we want the people to be able to interact with it, like the wings or um, um, different things that they can come up and want to take their picture with it. And maybe on the top put 
McKinley Hill neighborhood or something like that. So when they post it somewhere, it's like, hey, I was there, McKinley Hill neighborhood. Awesome. Yeah. So that sense of place. That's great. Um, thank you, Lynette. Sounds like your group had a great discussion. Um, Gabriel, who's going to report out from your group? From our group, we have Chelsea. Hey, everyone. Our group was amazing. We had so many ideas. So one of them is uh, to do like the VFW or to do something near the pipeline trail and incorporate, you know, messaging folks to go towards some of these incredible assets we have building a narrative up and down mckinley so that way we can continue to build on projects and create that narrative to have it be educational with history and culture interactive either through um, questions to marinate on or through technology to have it be seriously so accessible maybe built for kids so kids feel welcome and that they can engage in it as well we also talked about the bus stop a block from dusty's or maybe like the um, something near the retirement home, something near the scenic overlook, uh, some a connection with bike paths and putting community art there. Um, we said as far as a person to do it, that it would be great to have somebody from the tribe and ask them, what story do you want to tell here? But it doesn't necessarily need to be someone from here because so many folks are continuously displaced. And the vibe is like curi curiosity, wonder, DIY, nature, connection to nature. So that's that's what we did. Awesome. Um, thank you, Chelsea, and also Gold Star for fast reporting. So um, the next group is Rebecca's group, and I think Kathy is going to be our reporter. Hi. Um, what we had is one of the things we thought was really important is we wanted to represent the diversity of the neighborhood and of the cultures in the neighborhood. We thought that was very important. Next is we wanted it to be located. We didn't have one place in mind, although somebody in our group did offer his building and wall. We thought that was super important, but we wanted it to be located on, on McKinley Ave. McKinley is the main drag through our neighborhood. And we thought anybody who goes through there would see it one way or another. And we thought that was really important and we wanted on that street. Uh, last, we didn't think, we also don't think it's important for it to be an artist from the neighborhood. We just think it it's important that it be somebody with a strong feeling for the project. So as long as you pick a skilled artist with a sense of what they're doing and feeling for the project, we will be happy with that. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. And I was in your group and I feel like you covered it all. Thank you. Um, Naomi, who's going to report from your group? Uh, I'm actually going to report out. <laughs> so um, we had uh, narrowed in on two things. Okay, so we discussed about um, the artist and and thought that it's not necessary, but it would be nice for the artist to um, either be from the east side or have some sort of strong connection there, family connections or other other ties like that, and that sort of builds into that um, kind of community pride uh, aspect of it. Um, and for feeling um, about the piece, there was interest in um, a mural that could connect across time. So looking into the future of, you know, what McKinley is, isn't even yet um, and where it's been um, wanting um, a, a mural that the, the neighborhood um, that reflects what the neighborhood values uh, currently and, and what it will become as well. Great. Thanks, Naomi. Uh, Wesley, who's going to report from your group? Uh, we have That's Caroline. Okay. Hi there. We had a fun group as well. And we talked about how well the Lincoln District had done their rebranding and were uh, considering using that to coordinate and build momentum 
Um, more green microspaces were talked about, uh, the history of the builders of Tacoma, much like we had talked uh, heard from the history earlier in the meeting. Um, we discussed uh, that it's a multifaceted community and we'd like to see that represented. The VFW wall was talked about as well as the campfire building and the uh, coffee shop that apparently will no longer be a co coffee shop on the corner that I think was just painted green. Um, and we also like the idea of maybe functional art and um, having things be more interactive. Great, thank you. Hearing, I'm hearing some common themes through groups. This is great. Um, Susan's group, group six. Uh, take it away, Lay. Hi, we had a fun group as well. So for location, we really thought about somewhere that was central and very visible. So along the business corridor, um, we talked about the VFW, which was mentioned in another group, um, possibly the Chelsea apartments across the street from Dusty's Tavern because um, they have a big uh, brick facade on one side facing McKinley. Um, we talked about possible uh, doing utility box wraps or crosswalks. Um, for the artist, we had a strong preference for someone local, but it's not mandatory, just a strong preference. And then uh, we also uh, named a few artists that we liked from murals that are already existing in the city of Tacoma um, or other art projects. And then for impact, we really want it to be positive. So something that evokes feelings of like hope um, that has a historical connection that represents the community well, that can be interactive, um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, Alyssa's group, group seven. And I'll be sharing. So um, we talked about for location, some of the same um, places like the VFW and the Chelsea building, but also um, talked a lot about wanting something um, either at the beginning or the end, or you know, as people come into the corridor to like welcome people, give them that sense of place, let them know they're in you know, a, a special area. And then for artists, um, we had actually a few suggestions of artists, one that is from the east side and one um, that is Tacoma based. So we definitely thought to start with local first, but also like other people said, um, not to exclude people. I think this area attracts people from all over. So a good artist is a good artist. Um, and then for the themes or the feelings, um, something that really captures the essence of McKinley. Um, and that is really like that it's a laid back place, it's real people. Um, and it's it's um, kind of you know really welcoming. So kind of uh, wanting to capture those those sentiments. Great. Thank you, everybody, so much for participating in this discussion. Um, we'll be like we did from the last meeting. We'll be summarizing everything that we heard so that we're able to um, reflect all of your insights going forward. And so I'm going to talk a little bit. I know it's seven o'clock, but I'll just take one or two minutes here to wrap us up. Um, so just think, thinking about what's next for this work around arts and identity in McKinley. So um, as you know, we're going to be launching a working group around arts that will work with SpaceWorks. Um, and then we'll continue to think about other opportunities to integrate arts and identity into the business district. And, uh, and then also Lauren mentioned at the top, probably working with an artist to develop some identity elements throughout the district. So more to come on that. If you're interested in participating in that group um, or potentially in another working group, um, I think Mary's going to drop in the chat a link to a, a form that you can fill out. Um, we will have limited space in all of these groups. So if you're interested in multiple, please let us know. Um, and if you know, we'll base and we won't be launching all of these groups. Uh, right away, there's going to be multiple other groups throughout the spring. So um, fill out the form. Uh, express interest and then you may not hear from us for a little while as we're kind of sorting ourselves out working with our wonderful steering group um, but we will be in touch throughout the spring and we'll have plenty of other opportunities for you to participate in some of these other topic areas um, including our next event will be in April we're circling um, the 21st of April uh, we think that will be an in-person walk uh, about traffic calming and walkability um, we don't have all the details yet, so we'll send out an email um, and keep you all informed. And again, please do join um, one of those working groups uh, if you're in or express your interest in those working groups. Um, and then just to give you a, a bit of a preview, 
these are some of the future topics that will be that we're planning to have additional events to talk through. So I mentioned traffic calming and walkability. Come May, we'll be talking about open space and working with Metro Parks, um, and then thinking about things like the business district and housing and affordability, um, and then thinking about additional resources and capacity in the neighborhood that this, this program can support. So that's what we have for you tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your time um, and your wisdom and your thoughts and ideas. Um, please don't be a stranger. If you're interested in being involved in this program in any way, please reach out to Lauren or myself. Here are our emails. We're happy to set up a conversation or a phone call um, just to talk with you about your ideas and thoughts. And uh, we look forward to working with all of you throughout this process. And if folks do have questions and you'd like to stay on, I'm happy to do that. But I do want to let folks have folks go and probably have dinner. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.